everyone, we're going to get started. So first I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, this is so exciting for us as a counseling department to have you in person. Um, it feels really, really, really good. So I hope the night isn't too stressful. Um, so thank you again. I also want to give a very special thanks to ACMI. Um, they are volunteering their time here tonight to record our presentation. So just a little plug for them, if your student is interested in creating, producing, recording, um, any videos for school or town, have them contact ACMI for volunteer opportunities. And we are so grateful that they're, they're, they were able to make this happen for us. So thank you, ACMI. So I'm going to leave this slide up a little longer than I normally would because we've had some changes in our department this year. And of course the pink sheet that we made 300 copies of is wrong. So we're all adjusting, all right? So your pink sheet actually has the counselor breakdown and in the packet you also have this slide, all right? So um, I'm so sorry about the pink sheet. Um, but I promise you, anyone that had Ryan Cox now has Amy Lyons, and I will introduce her in one second, and you will be in great hands for the letters of recommendation, so please don't worry, all right? All right, so I have the counselor standing here, um, Carolyn Ress, she has the beginning, I'm sorry, I'm going to move this thing here. She has the beginning of the alphabet, A through C-A-R-A. -A. Next is myself, Danielle Rakowski. Uh, C-I to F-O, these are last names in case you didn't know. Um, Kathy Hirsch has F-R-A-N to K-E-N. Ann Benson, last names L-E to N-E-G. Karen Bocheller, N-I-R to S-C-H-I. And then Amy Lyons, S-T-E to Z. Matt Ruane is also new to us this year. We were so fortunate to have extra staff added to our counseling staff. Um, and why I saved him for last is because he has a variety of letters. Um, C-A-R-M to C-H-U-N, K-E-R to L-A-S-P, S-C-H-O to S-T-A. All right, I quit now, I'm done. No, I just, this is very complicated. And we also have a wonderful graduate intern with, the, with us this year. She's an Arlington High former grad, Sophia Shavs. And I won't forget anything else, I promise. All right, so I'm just gonna start with opening remarks, um, just give you a little bit of information and then we're going to hopefully stick to the 6.30 to 8 p.m. And we're going to do question and answer from 8 to 8.30. And we're really going to try to finish right at 8.30 so you guys can all get on with your lives after tonight. So one of our biggest messages as a department is um, to keep options open. We really talk to the students about that, try to give them a really good message about that. Very important. Counselors are here to help through the entire process. They're here to help the students, one-on-one, -on -one, in groups, and we're also here to help you. So please always feel free to reach out if you have any questions. We offer senior seminars throughout the next two weeks, and then this year we're gonna try something new through the month of October during X Block, which is Tuesdays about 2.10. We have guided seminars, so we're gonna do some seminars on college app, working on college apps, on resume writing, activity writing, um, and then just like the nitty gritty of the entire process. So we're gonna give the seniors a little extra hand holding. Um, in addition to um, the, on PSAT day, which is October 12th, we're gonna open up time. All the counselors are gonna be available for seniors to come in and we're gonna help them with their college applications. So a lot of extra time this year to work with the seniors. After our seminars, we work with students individually, one-on-one, -on -one, as many times as they need. Um, we'll answer all questions and do the A to, A to Z for the whole entire college application process. We will have coffee hours tomorrow morning 
Um, I think it's like 9 to 9.45. The Zoom links, uh, not that you can click on it from your paper presentation, but I will have the uh, slides posted to the school counseling website under announcements, so you can click on the live link there. And like I said, it's tomorrow morning, 9 to 9.45. Um, and on the, in the next slide, you'll be able to see uh, who's meeting with who. Also, one other thing, at the end of the packet, there's a QR code. If you could just scan that. When you get around to it, we'd like to keep attendance for, for who is here tonight. So last and most important is parents, you need to play a supportive role. Very important. But the students, your students, should drive the process. All right, so support is great, but don't do it for them. Coffee links, which I said is in your packet, but I'll also post this presentation. And I'm going to bring up Ms. Benson. She will continue from here to talk about school counseling supports and more. so much for braving the weather today. I'm Ms. Benson. I'm going to talk briefly about what supports are offered in the school counseling office. Um, one thing that we really ask students to do is continually check the student, the student counseling website. We try and distill the most important information for the school counseling website there. We really do get that they have a lot of different ways in which they can get information. Um, so the school counseling website is not only a great resource for them, but also for you. Uh, Ms. Rakowski, at the top of every month, sends via email a school counseling newsletter. It is jam-packed with fantastic information. So much like Dr. Janger's back-to-school letter, this letter, Ms. Rakowski tries to um, kind of brief you on the most important issues of that month. So you can imagine the fall is really going to be deadline driven as far as application issues. The spring, she's really going to incorporate information about scholarships. So please, if you can, pay, pay close attention to your emails, especially this fall when it's really mission critical to make sure we're not missing any deadlines. We also have a departmental Google Classroom that we um, try and keep as brief as possible, but also list, listing only the important items. We know that your student has um, Google Classrooms for all their academic subjects. So we thought it would be helpful for them to see everything they need in a school counseling department Google Classroom. We'll also post announcements about our group senior seminars, as well as the mini workshops that we're offering in October there. So rest assured, your students will get information in several different electronic formats. I think our biggest challenge is how do we reach that? <laughs> because we know that most of them are doing, you know, like the smallest you know, tweeting or Instagram or whatever. We're not doing Instagram as a department, but um, we're trying to stay relevant and while also being concise. The location of our offices has been a bit of a challenge because we are located on the like the furthest away. It's a good like seven minute walk. So it's not the most centrally located right now for students. We're, near, we're located near the back of the football fields or where, where people park. But your students are used to it. It's also across from the AHS nurse's office. So um, many of them have, have found us plenty in the last 12 months. So th this is where we'll be for the duration of their time here at AHS. Finally, I think it's really important, we feel it's really important to mention there's social and emotional support here in the school. We are the first line of defense as your student school counselor, but there's also school social workers here. So if you have a concern about your student, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we will um, assess the situation and figure out how best to support them here. This is really dry, I'm gonna breeze through it. This is a review of the graduation requirements. 106 credits by the end of senior year. Oh, P.S. by the way, this is for the state of Massachusetts. Um, it's not just something AHS manufactured. Four years of English, three years of math. Every school counselor on the stage 
has recommended to your student to take four years of math. The state requires three, but any public college or university here in the state of Massachusetts requires four. Three years of science, three years of social studies, U.S. history, one and two, modern world, two years of a world language, many students take three and even four, one year of a fine or performing art, five courses of wellness and PE. For the MCAS, we, um, of course, notice the typo at six. Um, in your packet, the paper packet, um, it's wrong. On this slide, it's correct. They, your student has to pass the ELA and the math. The science was waived because in spring 2020, due to the pandemic, your student wasn't able to sit for the science MCAS. Okay. And then 40 hours of community service. Your students are well aware of where they need to log those. That's in Naviance in a system called X2Ball. If they have any questions or concerns, they come down and talk to us and we show them where it is. So even though today is very, tonight is very um, college application heavy, we really want you to know that we discuss a full array of post-secondary options with students here at AHS. Yes, the majority of students graduate from here and attend a four-year college or university. And we also have students who we support um, applications to two-year colleges, Middlesex, Bunker Hill. Um, I worked with a student just today who is going to be doing a gap year next year. So we talked about the implications of that. What does that look like as far as uh, which schools will allow you to defer? Let's talk about some gap year fares or what your, what your goal is. So that is definitely in our wheelhouse and we're happy to talk to you or your student about that. Some students are interested in the PG year. Maybe they need one more year or want an, an additional year of high school. Um, that may sound crazy, but there are <laughs> some students who want another year, that's great. Uh, we can strategize with them about how we've um, worked with other students who had similar interests. Um, technical trade schools. Last year I had a student who was interested in plumbing. I have a student from a few years ago who also did Peterson's in electrical. So this is not, although it may not be the majority of students here, this is certainly things that we're well aware of and we can help guide your student if that's their path. Um, the military, that is also an option. Um, students can go into the reserves or they can join a selective service branch that, that is their interest and we can help support them getting more information about that. And certainly the world of work, right? Maybe they have a part-time job in high school that they really enjoy or they're not quite sure what they want to do and they're not ready to make that jump to commit to college or, or anything else. Totally fine. We'll talk about um, what's a good trajectory for the work you're in or how do you get to that job that you're interested in. Bottom line with this slide is there is no one size fits all. We are here to really make a tailored post-secondary plan for your student. So when we're talking about um, you know, what that post-secondary plan is, the, the term the right fit um, comes to mind. And there's some things we like to just kind of talk about um, with our students and with our families. It's really important to remain student-centered. What's the perfect fit for you might not be the perfect fit for your student. And oftentimes, kind of what informs like the parent's idea of what the fit is can be what their experience was. So we kind of joke in my household, I went to a Big Ten university, I'm from Wisconsin, I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. So like we play the fight song on Saturdays and the football game and you know, we've like indoctrinated our child. Well, she, you know, is going to end up at like a teeny tiny school. Um, and you know what? That is okay. Maybe she's gotten her fill of Bucky Badger, which is totally our fault. Um, so I'm gonna have to check myself. It's not about me and the Wisconsin fight song. Um, so keep that in mind when you're talking to your student about you know, what is it that they're interested in. The focus is on um, them, really. Also, academic offerings. What are they interested in? Does that school have courses in your student's major? That's a good thing. I mean, it sounds so basic, but it's important to check, right? Also, does it have um, academic course offerings in courses that they're interested in? Because what they say they want in October, fall 2022, may be totally different in March 2023. And that's okay. 
We just want to make sure that the courses and the opportunities at that school or at that job or at that gap year um, can bridge a, a wide array of interests. Um, financial need is really important. We will always talk about financial safeties as well as other academic safeties. Um, academic support programs, what's the tutoring services like there? If you have a student on a 504 or an IEP, what does the academic support look like at that school? That's important stuff to ask on tours. It's important stuff to sniff out on the website. Also, what about job placement? We all know about our local Northeastern and our co-op program. It's known for it. What about the other universities? Just great questions to think about when you're touring or talking to your student. So how do you get to know like what's the right fit for your student? This, there's nothing like boots on the ground on a college campus tour. For the last three years, um, colleges have really had to pivot, right? Because for a while they had to say, no, 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 no visitors. We will, you can join us virtually in a virtual open house. You can take a virtual tour. We will hold virtual info sessions. The good news is there was some pluses to that side of the pandemic because People could tour UCLA from the comforts of Mass Ave, right? And not be missing out on anything, because nobody could go. So we would still suggest you take advantage of the online offerings, you know, whether that be uh, you want to check out Mass Art and you want to find out about how to submit a good portfolio. Well, guess what? They're running an info session in three weeks. Get in front of your computer, you know? So you can leverage both, and we would encourage you to do that. Um, <coughs> Another great thing about Arlington High School is every day we have college reps coming to the building. It's, it's a tough building to come into because it's, it's confusing. So we're trying to help them find the right room and the students getting to the right room as well. But this is a great opportunity this fall. The admissions reps who come here are the readers for AHS. What that means is they're getting a personal interaction with that person who's looking over their information. So we would encourage your students not to go to every college they're interested in just because they'd miss a ton of class, but maybe pick the most important ones and sign up on Naviance and attend it. Um, and it just continue to explore the websites and if that college offers an interview, we would say go for it or at least think about it. Um, creating a balanced list. We recommend anywhere between six and eight college applications. That may sound bananas, it may sound like a lot. Some families think it's too little. Our experience has been, the college application process takes time. And your student is still a student here at AHS. In a, you know, the fall is busy for them. So you want to distill that list as much as you can to anywhere around that six and eight mark. If it's going north of eight, then pick up the phone or shoot, shoot your school counselor an email so we can chat about it. So we can talk, you know, what's, what's going on? How can we help? Um, we also talk to your student about reaches, realistics, and likelies. So reach, sound, a reach or a stretch, it, it is what it sounds like. Their academic credentials might be a little bit less than what that school is looking for, right? And a likely, means it's a good match, right? They're right on the button here as far as you know what that school typically accepts. And then a safety is their qualifications exceed that school's you know, average admittance. How do you find out where you fall in this? We use two tools. We use the websites and the emails that we get from the college admissions office. Um, and we also use Naviance, which can be a good gauge about where that is. In addition to just these academic reaches and safeties um, and, and likelies, we also pull in, as I mentioned before, uh, financial safeties because we know that um, it's important to keep the cost of college in mind regardless of what your list looks like. So we're always going to talk to your student about taking a, a look at schools that uh, might fit that financial safety profile as well. And then I think Ms. West is next. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So we're going to go through.
through and review the entire application process and all of the factors. So it might be a little overwhelming, but we're going to try to get through everything and make it as clear as possible. So first of all, just it's very important for students to research their deadlines and all the program components that go along with what schools they're applying to. So different um, requirements vary by school and by program. So for example, some schools may require an earlier application, such as a nursing program, fine arts, and you know maybe performing arts would want an audition or a portfolio. So it just depends, and it's really important to just stay organized and for students to really keep all of that information in a way that they can you know, have it at their fingertips and in a, in a manner that works for them because there are a lot of deadlines to pay attention to um, and just important that deadlines are deadlines. So students should just make sure to try to, you know, stay organized and beat the deadlines. Um, just here we have a few of the really important websites that students will be using throughout this time. So obviously the school counseling site which has a lot of information about the whole process um, Naviance students have accounts and also the Common App. So we're going to help students in the group seminars that are coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, and they're going to help. We're going to help them match their accounts. So everything is electronic in the process of the applications, and the Common App is a universal application site that over 1,000 colleges accept. So more and more each year are climbing on and and taking the Common App, and so it really streamlines the whole process for students so that they're not having to go to every single individual college's website, and they can just add their colleges to the Common App site and apply that way. So some, some colleges don't accept it, and then they do have to apply through their website, but the majority of schools do accept it, and that's something that we're gonna help them with um, to match up their accounts. Some students may have already done that. So we also help them set up accounts if they don't have one already. Um, also, fee waivers are available for students if they need them, and they actually request that through the Common App, so we can show them that as well. So this next, this next slide goes over some of the different admissions plans, and I'm sure maybe some of you, if you've done this before, you've seen some of these different terms, and they can get very confusing. So I'm going to go over some of these, and basically the regular decision is your standard regular time frame where students usually apply around January 1st or 15th and they hear back usually by April 1st and then they need to decide by May 1st. That's the reply date that they have to decide by. So early action, there's, a, there's several different types of early plans and they can get a little confusing. Early action is a non-binding admissions plan that many colleges do have and students usually apply around November 1st, November 15th, sometimes in December, depending on the school. They still do have until May to make their decision. So this could be a really good plan for some students if their schools offer it, um, especially if they're organized, they have everything ready to go, they want an answer earlier because they usually hear probably by the end of December in most cases, um, and also if they have a solid transcript going into it. And I'll talk more about that. So that's still a non-binding plan that lets students apply earlier and get an answer earlier. So that can be helpful for students. This next one, the restrictive early action. So it depends on the college's specific policy on what the restrictions are, but basically it's, it's an early plan, it's non-binding, and then has certain restrictions. So for example, a student or a plan might say that they can apply to other early action schools, but they cannot apply to an early decision program if they're doing this regular, I'm sorry, restrictive early action. So it really does depend on the college, so you don't need to memorize this now. Um, early decision is a binding plan. So this is the one that differs, and it really has to be done under careful consideration because this is really a big family decision where the student and family need to be on board. And it really, it, it involves you know, a student being 100% sure this is their top choice of school and that if accepted, so they're signing an agreement, the family, the counselor, and the student sign saying that the student will attend if they're accepted and that they have to withdraw all of their other applications. So it is a big, you know, it's a big consideration and students, on the one hand, it can give them a competitive edge because it does show that they're committed to the school and that they really do want to go there. But on the other hand, it doesn't let them compare financial packages and, you know, changing their mind and things like that. 
So that's something that's you know a, a big decision, and we talk about that with students, and we always do have students who decide to do this, but there's definitely you know careful consideration for that. Um, and also just to say the deposit, or I'll get to that in a second, but the deposit deadline is a little bit earlier than May, so they would have to deposit earlier. When do you typically hear back? It's usually the same as the early programs, so it just depends on the school, but usually in December, I would say. So it's kind of the same thing, except it is binding. That's the difference. Um, and so just to, and, and you know, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about that plan as well. Um, so priority is another, is another deadline or another plan that you may see schools have. And basically, it depends on the school, but sometimes they have a date by which if students apply, they'll get consideration for merit scholarships or they might get a preference, you know, preference will be given to applications received by January 1st or December 1st or something like that. So it just really depends on the school and what they offer. Um, you know, for example, many nursing programs are due for students before the regular college of that school. So it's just something to think about and just to check. Um, sometimes you may see rolling applications, which means that colleges accept applications as students complete them and submit them and then they process them. So there's not really a date, but they do continuously on an ongoing basis. Um, review applications and then give a decision. So in those cases, it's usually best not to wait too long because spots can fill up, but just to keep them in the same time frame as the other applications. So that's something else you might see. And overall, you know, it's very important, and we help students with this, but that they that they apply under the plan that will make their application its best. So for example, if a student maybe needs their first quarter of senior year to really improve their grades, get their GPA up, it might be best to wait until the regular time frame because it just gives them more grades to come in and more of a chance to prepare. Whereas a student might be ready to go, they have strong grades, they want to apply early and get that in. Sometimes students apply to some schools early, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. So that can be really helpful too. And we'll help them when we meet um, individually to do what's best for them. So that is, um, yep, yeah. sorry. So this is a really important slide, and this is something that we make sure students are aware of. It's gonna be posted to our Google Classroom and it's on the website, and we're also gonna go over it in our seminars. So this is the transcript request deadlines. So you can see it's about three, three weeks prior to a college deadline is when we require students to make their request for their transcripts in Naviance. So this is very, very important, and I think there's always confusion because we deal with it every year, but students must make the request in Naviance for us counselors to know to send a transcript to colleges. So a student could be working on something in the Common App or in the college's own application and submit it, but then if they never requested the transcript through Naviance from us, then we wouldn't know that they applied. So that's really the only way that we'll know. And we teach them how to do this, we give them directions, we make sure that they know. But it's really important that they match their accounts and that they're um, actually <coughs> requesting the transcript. So we send, because um, you know, the three weeks, we need the time to compile and write our recommendation letter, the school report form, the school profile, along with the transcript. So for us to get all that together, we do want to have a little bit of time. So it's very important and we go over this a lot with them. And so we're gonna go through all of the different factors considered in the admissions process. So we'll start with the transcript, and it's, um, so students will get their transcripts in the seminars that we're having to review in case they have any questions. And only the final grades for each year of completed school goes on the transcript. So right now they're just going to see 9th, 10th, and 11th grade final grades, as well as the GPA, which is gonna be cumulative through 11th grade, the end of 11th grade. And the GPA is also in Naviance, their most up-to-date GPA. So as the senior year grades come in each quarter, they get posted and we send first term grades to colleges and second term 
and then we send the final transcript with the final grades to the college that the student will be attending. So we only send the third term grades if the college specifically requires it, but we don't automatically send that like we do the others. And both the weighted and unweighted GPAs appear on the transcript. So the weighted is out of a 5.25 and the unweighted is out of a 4.3. But many times colleges do recalculate the GPA based on their own formula. So for example, UMass, the UMass system, all of the colleges, they, they um, recalculate the GPA to standardize it. So they do that. Also, it's important to note that only the classes from Arlington High School are factored into the GPA. So if a student transferred in from another, call, or from another high school, those grades and classes go on the transcript that we have, but they don't get factored into the GPA. And we make that clear on the transcript for colleges to see. But colleges, of course, still will see the grades and will be able to recalculate things if that's what they do. So they'll see everything. It just doesn't actually get factored into our GPA. And um, I think that's it. Oh, and just another note, um, we go over this as well when we give our directions to students, but in the Common App, when students are filling that out and they have to report their GPA, they would put that they want their weighted GPA, that, that, that that's what we use, a weighted GPA. Even colleges do see both. They see both on the transcript, but they would put weighted GPA out of a 5.0 scale even though ours is 5.25, but we use the, that's what we say, 5.0, because they don't have the 5.25. So I know some people always have questions on that. So let's see. And to continue with the transcript, so what colleges are looking for are really the strength of the student's courses and if they're challenging themselves appropriately. Also, if they are showing upward trends and trajectory, so their grades are improving or maintaining their grades and not declining. Of course, we know, especially with the past few years, that there's extenuating circumstances and students definitely have a chance to explain anything that may have impacted their, um, their record in the application. And that's what we go into this later in the presentation, but counselors as well are able to do this in the recommendation letter. So students and counselors can explain things that may have you know, impacted negatively the um, student's transcript. And um, I may have said this, but early applications will only have the final grades through junior year when they initially apply. And then as the first term grades come out in November, then we send them along to the college. Um, but regular applications, they will have the first term grades available at the start. So that's what I was saying about applying when the application will be at its best for the student. Also, we'll be, um, the, the GPAs get updated after the first semester. So when we send mid-year grades, they'll have the updated GPA, okay? And then we send the mid-year grades. So, I think that finishes it up with the transcript. So I'll pass it to Karen for the standardized tests. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk about a really fun part of the application process, our standardized testing. Um, so these are the different ways that we can submit scores, that students submit their scores. Um, there are schools that are test optional, and thanks to COVID, many more schools, over 1,700 additional schools than prior to COVID, have gone test optional. Um, so students who maybe aren't the strongest test takers are in a really good spot to have that as one less component of their application process. Test blind, um, there are some schools that accept scores uh, in their application system, but they're test blind, they don't look at them at all. So you can submit them, they won't use them to factor into their decision process in any way. Um, colleges really do take a holistic approach to reviewing student applications. They look at everything that we send, everything that the students fill out and submit. And test scores, have become a thing that colleges are able to make a really valuable decision about a student's um, acceptance based on the other factors that they're submitting. So the test scores, um, as much as they're, they're very important to some schools, and they're still important if a student is in a higher range of what the school um, has typically accepted, um, it's really not a factor that if a student decides not to submit them, it will not hurt their application. So we want students to really use their, their time filling out applications on all of those 
components where they can show their strengths. Um, if they haven't had the opportunity to take the SATs or ACTs, um, or their scores weren't where they, they could be um, in terms of the number. So there's a few different standardized tests that students can take. Um, the SAT is the, the most common and, and one that us, you know, on the East Coast is, has been the most popular over the years. Uh, we do offer the SAT or T uh, here at Arlington High School. Tomorrow is the deadline for the October test. So it's kind of the, the final day for a late registration fee um, that is still available. September 20th is the last day to register with a late fee for the October test. There are additional tests throughout the year. There's also the ACT. Um, what happened many years ago is that 100% of colleges will accept the SAT or ACT. And the big difference is that they're scored differently, and the ACT has that science component that a lot of students do really well on if science is a, su a subject that they're strong in. Um, it's a choice. It, there's no right or wrong or one that's better than the other. Um, but what's interesting is when students do take both of them, there are score comparison charts, um, and sometimes they do score higher on one over the other based on comparison. So, um, so it's interesting to compare those numbers but we know with limitations in test opportunities over the past few years, not every student has had a chance to take one or more standardized tests. The, um, for students whose uh, uh, language is not, their first language is not English, they may also need to submit either a TOEFL or additional English proficiency test results. So that's something really important. It depends on the school. Um, so if, if the student has been educated in the United States or in English, uh, in an English speaking program, their entirety of their education. Um, they might be waived the requirement to take the TOEFL, um, but there's other ways to show English proficiency um, for students who are maybe multilingual or English was not their first language. Um, AP exams come up in May. Um, many of you, if, if you have a um, a child at the high school who is taking APs this year. Um, you'll see the test dates come out, they're, they're May and sometimes into the beginning of June, but May is a big month. Um, those AP exam scores are typically not sent as part of the application process. What happens with the, SA, or the AP scores is that once a student is accepted to a university, they have committed to that school, then you work with the school to determine if they will accept test scores towards something. Some of them waive a prerequisite for a higher level course. Some will put it on the college transcript and use it as college credit. So different ways that they can um, accept those AP scores for different things. Um, test optional schools are listed on a website, fairtest.org. Fairtest.org existed again before COVID, but they do have a section that incorporated all of the schools that decided to do away with the requirement for standardized tests um, throughout the pandemic. Um, and again, like the, like the applications, students can qualify for fee waivers for this, so please um, contact your, your counselor and we can help students with fee waivers for the SAT, ACT. <coughs> um, the next are how scores are sent to schools and the different ways um, of kind of picking and choosing what gets sent to the colleges. So score choice. Score choice is where you take the dates um, so let's say an October test date, and you submit the scores just for the October test date um, versus the you know, last spring's March test date. Um, but maybe a student did better in March than they did in October, they want to send the March test. So that's score choice. Super score is where you can pick and choose within different test dates sections that give the highest total score. Not every school will do score choice or super score the SAT. Um, cumulative scores. So what you want to do is when you submit the scores, all of these scores get sent directly from the testing organization, so through collegeboard.org or through ACT. Um, it will actually, when you choose the school to send the scores to, it will let you know what the school prefers. So most schools are going to request all of the scores from every se um, test session that a student sat for. So that's really important to check. Um, there are some that allow you to choose one over the other, but a lot of them just want all of the test results so they can see sort of how the student has done over time. 
um, which is, is important to know if a student does really well on one section and not well on the other, they can't take it a second time and try to go for the opposite to balance it out um, because that school might look for um, all of the scores and, and see that there's a big discrepancy there. So it's important just to, for students to do their best on all their test sessions. Um, again, the, uh, sending the scores, you'll go directly to the testing organization. Um, the AP scores are self-reported in some application systems. Um, they're also it, within the application, and this is important to note, um, when, a, when a student is filling out the Common App, there is a section where they can put their standardized test score. If the student is choosing to not submit the score, they're going test optional, they should leave that blank, because if it gets submitted to a school on accident that is not test blind, that school will see the score. Um, we have had students make that mistake. They can contact the school and say, are you able to get rid of my score in the system and not use it towards um, you know, considering my application for admission? Um, but they do have those numbers, so be really careful about what gets input into those standard, uh, the, the Common App and standardized application programs to make sure that things aren't submitted that shouldn't be. And again, most of the schools are gonna require the, um, the actual test score from the testing organization just to verify those numbers. Um, but there are some schools that will only take that self-reported score. Um, those are other things that we, as we work with students on their application timeline and different components, those are all things that we also talk to them about. So moving on from standardized tests, um, we have lots of writing that goes into the application. Um, so the, the essay is a really important piece of the application. That's where the student gets to write a wonderful, creative piece about themselves to share uh, part of their character, something interesting about themselves, to the school that's probably not noted elsewhere. Um, it might be mentioned briefly in their activity section. Um, it might be something that's mentioned in there, but to be able to write a whole essay is really powerful. It shows them as a real person. Um, and it really gives the, the college admissions representatives some depth to who the student is. Um, a lot of our English classes have been working on these essay drafts between the end of junior year into senior year. Um, we as school counselors review essays with students. And uh, so there's, there's lots of support for getting people to review and give feedback and help students to finalize their essays before they are placed into their applications and submitted. Um, the, uh, the essay, the main essay, um, there are different topics to choose from, and then there's an open topic. So it's a 650 word maximum. When you paste it into the Common App, it actually cuts off at 650, so if it's 651 words, and that last word is really powerful, that will not, it will make sense. So um, it's just something important for students to keep in mind is that word count. And then there's supplements as part of the application. So the supplements are additional questions that are specific to each individual college that the student is applying to. So in the Common App, there's the one main essay that gets sent to all colleges, and then each individual school will have some questions that are specific to their school. A lot of them ask something called, why, it's known as a why us question. It's really asking the student to say, why are you applying to our school? What is it about us that you know, you're considering? Um, and so that's something that it should take some thought. It doesn't need to be that creative writing piece like the full essay, but it should be something very specific about that school. So I encourage students to do research on something about the school, really like what it is that they love about it, why they feel that they are a good fit, and why they feel that the school is a good fit for them. So really putting into perspective um, something that they really feel passionate about in terms of applying and, and possibly attending that school in the future. Um, each college is different, so there are also additional writing requirements that may be in the, um, the, the writing section of the Common App for each school. Some colleges put really obscure creative questions in there, and the students are like, I don't know why they would ask that. And it's really just to see you know, some creativity and open-mindedness of the student. 
Um, and some are asking pretty straightforward, what do you want your major to be, do you plan on living on campus, things like that. So it's just really important to take time to look through those, for students to answer them fully, um, and to make sure that the, um, the responses are clear in what the, the applicant wants the college to know about them. There was a question added not too long ago, specific to COVID and how the pandemic has affected a student. This is in an additional information section of the application, so it's a completely different section of the Common App um, than the, the standard essay writing piece. Um, it is optional, and I stress that it's optional because we really encourage students to only write this essay topic, um, or to answer this essay topic, if their family has truly undergone something um, really exceptional over the past couple of years, um, we all got stuck at home with our family and uh, we all couldn't go on vacations and trips and, and things like that. So we really want it to be something that is um, going to add value to their application. So the college knows that that student was impacted by the pandemic um, in a really powerful way. So we encourage students to ask us as, as counselors if it's something that they should or should not include, um, and we can talk through with them um, on whether that's a, a question that is appropriate to answer um, or something that might not add value. So it's really important just to make sure that value is being added to the application. And moving on from writing and writing about COVID, I'm passing it on to Kathy to talk about letters of recommendation. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Hirsch again. Um, thanks for sticking with us. We're, we're getting there. We're almost to the end of this information, but it's all important for you to hear. So I'm going to start with some more factors considered in the admission process, um, beginning with teacher recommendations. You may recall last winter and spring, we asked the students to ask two teachers to write recommendations um, for college for them. If your student didn't do that last spring, it's okay. We can coach them through the process now. Um, but basically, the teacher recommendation is gonna focus on the teacher's observation of that student in their class. So they're, they're quite specific. Um, we ask students to consider that when deciding which teachers to ask to write the letters. It doesn't mean that um, you know, a student is interested in humanities, will only ask humanities teachers to write the letter. But um, students, you know, sometimes had um, an experience where they worked really hard and improved in a class, and that might be a good choice to ask that teacher. It doesn't have to be a class where they were a straight A student um, by any stretch of the imagination. We're gonna ask that the students this fall check in with the teachers that they already asked last spring, hopefully. Um, again, thanking them for agreeing to write the letter. Um, at that time, hopefully the student will um, let the teacher know that they completed the teacher recommendation questionnaire in Naviance. That's um, a piece that the teacher uses when they're writing the letter. It asks the student to reflect on specific um, components of the class for that teacher. Um, and when they do check in with the teacher, they're gonna, they're gonna let them know, um, you know, my first deadline coming up is November 15th. Again, we're looking for that similar time frame that we're asking for for the transcript recommendation request, so a good three weeks in advance of um, expecting something to be written. And then the teacher will, the um, student will invite the teacher through Naviance to upload the letter. The teacher will be able to see all of the um, transcript, uh, transcript requests and upcoming deadlines for the student there. And then the teacher will submit the letter directly to colleges through Naviance. So, um, Teachers are the only people who see the letters, the counselors don't see the letters, the students don't, the uh, parents and guardians don't see those letters. And uh, you know, the confidentiality there is really driven by what the colleges are asking for, and they want to know that these letters are written in confidence so that they're a true assessment um, of the student. One small um, piece is we ask that, um, Students do not invite Arlington High School teachers to write letters through the common application. There'll be a, a component on the common application about um, recommenders. Students don't input Arlington High teachers there. Um, we're gonna handle that through the Naviance process. 
So we also have counselor letters of recommendation. Um, this is a little less stress for the students. We don't ask them to come to us to request that we write the letter. It's assumed that we will write the letter for the student. However, when we meet with the student individually, after we have the group seminars, we'll be talking to them about um, you know, what they might like that letter to look like. The counselor letter is a broader overview of the student and it will take a different focus for each student. So um, maybe there's a student who had a great deal of improvement over the last four years in high school, and we really want to highlight that for that student. There could be a student who, as Karen mentioned, had um, extenuating circumstances over the past four years that we were going to want to highlight that in the letter. Um, but we do ask the students to each complete a questionnaire in Naviance, which is a much broader questionnaire than what we're asking um, them to do for the teachers. And I think it, it helps the student to reflect about themselves and their high school experience as well as their future goals. And we find it really useful um, when we're writing the letters to include some of that information. We also ask the students to give us a resume. And there is a resume function in Naviance that students can use. And we'll, we showed them that last winter. We'll show them again in the seminars. Um, but if your student um, wrote a resume in another in another format, maybe a more creative. I had a really beautiful one from an art student once. As long as they forward it to us, it's okay. It doesn't have to be through the Naviance program, but we would like to see a resume to make sure we can give you know, a nice, a nicely rounded picture of the student to the college when we're writing the letter. Additionally, so each student has a Naviance account, and each parent or guardian may have an account if you would like to have one. Um, if you don't have one yet and you want one, you can email your student's counselor and we can activate that for you. And within the parent um, account on Naviance, you could complete something called the parent or guardian response form. It's not required, but again, it's helpful. And it asks, uh, it asks you to um, talk about the student from your perspective. Of course, you know a lot more about them um, than anyone. So sometimes your insights are really valuable when we're writing those letters as well. So we have teacher recommendations, counselor recommendations, and then often students will ask us about outside recommenders. One thing to note is that some schools are limiting how many letters of recommendation they'll accept. Not only read, but accept. Um, and you can see that in Naviance when you look into the specific college after requesting transcripts. So some schools will take an unlimited number, some schools will only take one, some will only take two. So we want to be careful that the letters that hold the most weight are the letters that are read by each of the schools that the student applies to. So more is not necessarily better when it comes to letters of recommendation. If a student has an outside recommender who they feel really knows them well in a, in a way that is going to be portrayed differently than the teacher or the counselor, then consider one outside recommender. It could be someone who taught them music lessons for a long number of years, or a coach in a sport that they excelled in, or a supervisor at a job where they did a really, um, they worked really hard through the pandemic, or uh, volunteer work. This is not, we're not saying all students should be asking for outside recommenders. This is, these are just some guidelines to consider if your student is thinking about asking someone from the outside. If the outside recommender is not affiliated with Arlington High School, not a teacher here, um, then you can invite them through the common application. But if it's anyone with an, uh, an Arlington email, do not invite them through the common application. Other factors considered in the admission process. So, you know, I look at the process, it's two-sided and it's, it's similar on each side. The student is trying to learn as much as they can about the college. Um, and find the best fit for them. And the college is looking to learn as much as they can about each student to find the best fit of students for their campus to meet their own um, institutional goals. So extracurricular activities is a way that can help on both sides. So um, students are asked to list their extracurricular activities in the common application under the activities section. There's a space for 10 activities there and they're asked to sort them in order of importance to the student. Um, Again, this is more a case of quality versus quantity. If you have a very active student, some students have been involved with multiple things, they're able to fill 10 spaces easily about, with meaningful activity, then that's great. Other students may have 
put all of their energy in, in one specific area or one or two. And they look at the list and they think, oh gosh, I don't have you know, 10 things to list. It's more about thinking about um, you know, how that student's being portrayed to someone who doesn't know them, how they can get to know them better. And that's really, um, colleges do value students who spend more time doing fewer things and really um, you know, take a deeper dive into, into the activities they're involved with. So don't feel worried about that or we encourage the students not to feel less than because maybe their list isn't as long as someone else's, but theirs may be more meaningful than the student who has the longer list. So just keep that in mind. Um, that said, it is time to brag. Um, include honors and activities. Students ask us questions all the time. Well, with that, that award I got in English class in 10th grade, does that really count? I don't know. Yes, everything counts. So any kind of award or honor, put it down there. Be proud of the things that you've done. Um, and if there are questions about that, we're here to help with it. If a student uh, is, is super involved and 10 spots isn't gonna do it, there are additional um, things that the, the student wants the college to know about them. They do have the option of adding additional information to the common application under the additional information section um, and actually uploading a formal resume. I wouldn't encourage a student to upload a resume that's just um, a reiteration of everything they already listed under the 10 activities. But if there's something about that resume that's going to speak to the college, it's going to really help them get to know the student better, they do have the option to upload the resume. Demonstrated interest, this is an interesting topic. Some, some colleges, not all, um, consider the level of student engagement with the college when they're reviewing applications. They might track points of contact the student has had with the college, including things like visits to campus, um, virtual information sessions, college fair visits. Um, it was mentioned earlier, the college representatives who are coming to Arlington High School, if the student takes time to go to that meeting for schools that they're interested in, um, you know, those are sometimes large groups. So a school like Northeastern University is gonna have a large number of students turn out for that. It will be more like a, a lecture kind of situation but oftentimes the smaller schools will have fewer students and it becomes a conversation and almost a mini sort of interview um, scenario. So connections can be made when students are doing that. Um, we have had students go back and contact the college rep they met at Arlington High School after being um, put on a wait list for a school and actually got an action out of that and at the Ivy League level admitted to the school. So don't underestimate the importance of making contact of demonstrating that you're interested in a school and why. Some schools have said they track how many emails students open that are sent by the college. It's getting a little, it's getting to be a little bit much here. Um, but just, just to give the, the general, um, get the gist that they are, they are watching and colleges are trying to recruit students who really want to be with them. Um, Boston University, to give an example, this was before the pandemic. However, at that time, one of the, the rep came here and said, you know, if I have a student from Arlington who's applying to Boston University and has not come to campus for a tour or an information session, then that's, that's a, a question mark for them. Now, I would have a response to that, saying, you know, there may be other ways that student has experienced Boston University, but in the mind of that admissions representative, it seemed like the student's not that interested if they don't take the five mile um, train ride to go, go for an info session at BU. Again, like I said, it's all back to finding the right fit from the college side and the student side. Okay, interviews. This is just another opportunity um, for students to distinguish themselves. So some colleges offer interview opportunities, a chance for a student to tell their story to what could be an alumni representative that lives in the area or an admissions um, representative who's actually reading applications. So an interview is not necessarily for everyone. It's gotta be a student who feels comfortable talking about themselves. We can offer a little bit of coaching along those lines if they need it. Um, but colleges, you can check on the college website, the admissions page website, to see if they offer interviews. Um, some schools, Harvard has been requiring interviews of our students for a few years. They'll contact us for every applicant. Um, and ask to help set up interviews for them. So interviews could be 
um, informational, where it's just a chance for the student to learn more about the school. Um, it's also a chance to demonstrate interest. And they could be evaluative, meaning there'll be a write-up from the interview that will go become a part of the student's application and considered um, when they're making an admission decision. So of course we want students to be prepared when they go to interviews. Um, happy to help with that. Students who are applying for fine and performing arts programs um, may be required to do pre-screenings, um, auditions, or provide portfolios to schools. These deadlines come up quick. Um, so if they haven't been researched yet, now is the time to research requirements and deadlines for any of those programs. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt Ruane. Next. Hi everyone, uh, once again, my name is Matt Ruane. I have that interesting senior caseload that kind of looks like I handpicked my students. Um, but I'm gonna pick up with the competitiveness of college majors. Um, basically, for students who are looking to apply to a specific major or program within a university, um, whether that be a nursing program, computer science, business, uh, it can often be more challenging to get accepted just because of the popularity and the peer numbers. Um, they have a lot of applicants in competitive majors and only a limited number of spots. So whenever you're visiting college campuses or attending college information sessions, be sure to ask about the competitiveness of certain majors, uh, particularly the ones that your student's interested in, just because that can be helpful in determining whether that program's a reach, a target, or a safety for your student. Uh, similarly, the Naviance, for anyone who's been utilizing Naviance, they have the standards for each college, um, average accepted SAT score, average accepted GPA. Uh, those standards are reflective of the college and not the individual uh, specific majors. So just know that the more competitive majors, those standards are probably a little bit higher than what you're seeing on Naviance, okay? And all this information is just to encourage you and your student to be strategic about which majors they're choosing. I mean, first and foremost, if this is what they're interested in and this is what they're passionate about, then absolutely that's what they should pursue. But for the students who are a little less certain, um, you know, undecided, you know, being strategic about the majors can be helpful. And certainly any college that allows you to have a backup major listed, then certainly put in a backup just to increase that chance of, of being accepted. Um, so special circumstances, we've hit on this uh, a couple times tonight, here's just some more information on it. Um, the admissions teams will consider special circumstances on a case-to-case -case basis, okay? And by special circumstances, we're talking about, you know, any major challenge or obstacle or, you know, event that prevented a student from performing at their typical level, okay? So while all of our students were impacted by the recent pandemic, the special circumstances is really for students who have more to tell or more to explain. Um, you know, why did you miss a significant number of days your freshman year? Why did your grades drop uh, towards the end of sophomore year? Um, you know, that's what we're looking for in, in the special circumstances. Um, again, there's sections in the Common App and the additional information where students can, can write their piece, tell their story. Um, there's also interviews uh, for students who are more comfortable having that conversation. It can be very beneficial for them to tell their story, you know, kind of control that narrative, then leaving it up to the admissions team to, to assume. Um, and then also, too, we have our uh, counselor recommendation letters where we, too, can address any special circumstances for students. So the NCAA Eligibility Center, uh, some of you may remember this as the, the old clearinghouse, okay? So for students who are interested in playing college athletics at the Division I or Division II level, so not D3, D1 or D2, okay? They need to register and be cleared by the NCAA. Um, the Eligibility Center is an organization within the NCAA that determines the academic eligibility and amateur status for D1 and D2 athletes, which We've included the link up here, but you can simply just Google NCAA Eligibility Center, and that's the first link that pops up as well. Uh, transcripts and standardized testing is required, so if your student, again, is pursuing this, have them reach out to us for a transcript, um, but they themselves are gonna have to send their SAT scores uh, to be cleared. Um, 
And at this point, most students who are looking into Division One, Division II um, eligibility, you know, probably should have started talking to coaches uh, at this point. If not, that should be their first step. They should probably talk to their coach and let them know that this is something that they're interested in. So just to shift gears a little bit, financial aid and scholarships, okay? So in terms of financial aid, some schools are need blind, which means that a student's ability to pay for their education is not a factor when admissions is making their decisions, okay? Other schools are need aware, which means that they examine a, stu examine a student's financial need during that time of admission, okay? As you guys know, tuitions vary from school to school. Um, it's certainly something that you know, we want our students to take note of as they're creating their college lists. Um, and we also encourage our families uh, to have discussions with their students to talk about which colleges may be more of a financial hardship and which ones may be less of a financial hardship, just so students you know, have that information um, prior to applying to colleges. Um, you know, similarly, when you're visiting colleges, going to information sessions, um, you know, asking those questions to admission reps, um, you know, people who work at the college to find out information, um, that's always a good idea because in each college, state, region, there's usually some financial aid um, components that you know, they put together, some programs that they might know about that we don't know about uh, that they can clue you in on. Uh, for instance, here in Massachusetts, we have the tuition break created by the New England Board of Higher Education. We have the, the uh, mass transfer program, the A to B degree, um, which I'll get into in a second. But this is just to say we understand that this is a financial investment, a huge financial investment. And there's a lot of ways to save money, and we just want to make sure that you guys are clued into them so we can help make this you know, a more affordable and more comfortable process for you. All right, so as I just mentioned, the uh, tuition break. Um, this program provides significant tuition savings to residents of the six New England states when they enroll in out-of-state public colleges and universities within New England and pursue approved programs, okay? So to clarify that statement, it's basically saying that if you guys have a student who's interested in attending a Massachusetts public school, okay, and they have a particular program that they're interested in pursuing, but they can't seem to find that program in the Massachusetts state public schools, if they see that New Hampshire has it or that Maine has it, they can enroll in that university at a reduced price, which is great. Um, mass transfer program, the A to B map, okay, this is where students start off um, going to a community college okay, earning their associate's degree, and then they're able to transfer to a UMass school or a state university to finish their bachelor's. Okay, this is great for students who, you know, certainly are looking to save money, but also for students who might not be ready to make that four-year commitment to college after they graduate. They might want to start with two and go from there. Okay, now for students who do that, you know, there's great financial benefits, and if they have a 3.0 or higher GPA, they can save even more money, uh, thanks to the Commonwealth commitment. Okay, so again, these links are here. You guys can further explore that, but this kind of segues perfectly into our financial aid night. So October 3rd, we're going to be hosting a financial aid night here. Okay, it's very, very informative, very helpful, um, especially for those of you who are going through this process for the first time. Okay, we'll cover the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid. All right, the FAFSA is this giant pool of federal funds that opens on October 1st, but that pool is not bottomless. So we encourage you guys to start your applications in October, November, as opposed to waiting until January, February, uh, just to give your kid a better chance um, you know, at earning more dollars. Uh, the CSS profile is another great way to save money. A lot of uh, private institutions use the CSS profile. Some even require it, which is great. Um, if you fill out that CSS profile, which you can find on the College Board, again, it just helps colleges understand your financial need and, you know, to the best of their ability, they're able to give back. Okay, the only thing is, if you don't fill out the profile, they're unable to help you. So, the FAFSA and the CSS profile are, are definitely two um, areas where you can save with financial aid. Now, the financial aid piece kind of goes hand in hand with the application, okay? Just think of financial aid as this fall going up into the application deadlines 
And then afterwards, you know, that's more so when you'll see scholarships come into place, okay? Um, two of the more popular scholarships, the Stanley Coughlick and the Abigail Adams, these are merit-based MCAS scholarships um, that are based off 10th grade MCAS scores, so for the math and English section. Um, the Stanley Coughlick, if your student qualified, they'll receive a notification um, and they'll be able to apply for that. And the Abigail Adams is automatically applied to students who qualified for that. And these are for Massachusetts public institutions. Um, only. All right. Uh, scholarships. Um, again, you're going to hear us talk more and more about Naviance. It's just kind of where we anchor a lot of our, uh, our general information, including scholarships. Uh, under the scholarships tab, you'll see a number of private scholarships. Um, eventually, there's going to be even more. You know, it's still early in the year. Um, our town scholarships are going to come around. Um, please, please, please encourage your students to apply for the town scholarships, which happens right around the turn of first semester to second semester. Uh, we have a lot of money and we know how hard these kids work and we just want to make sure that, you know, they're, they're the benefactors of, of all this money. Um, and then finally, last plug, MIFA, the Gurus, Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority. I mean, they're the experts when it comes to financial aid for, for Massachusetts residents, students. Um, they are not only great in how much knowledge they have, but they are amazing in how they communicate it. Um, you know, for lack of a better term, there's a lot of hand-holding, a lot of simplifying. Again, especially for you, though, for those folks who are going through this for the first time, their website has information, webinars, they even do one-on-one -on -one calls. Um, so you'll learn a lot more about them as well at the Financial Aid Night. But one last plug, Financial Aid Night, 10-3, 6.30 here. All right, so I'm going to be passing it over to Ms. Lyons, who's going to be talking about, sorry, <laughs> Ms. Rakowski, who's going to be talking about roles and responsibilities. Thank you. We're almost done, I promise. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm just going to give a really, really quick summary. So someone said earlier, if you need an account, each student can have multiple parent guardian accounts, so just send us an email and we can always um, release that to you. So quickly, Naviance roles. Um, so students, parents, guardians have access to research colleges on Naviance. We used it last year a ton with the juniors. I know there are some new seniors here. Hopefully they've had some Naviance experience, but if not, we'll, we'll work through it. Um, Rep visits have been mentioned several times. We have over 150 coming. We kindly ask that the students please sign up on their Naviance account. Um, in addition, if we make any changes to locations, which happened so far this week and today's Monday, um, we've had a bunch of location changes because you know we're under construction and fighting for space in this building is really difficult. So um, if your student is signing up for visits, please ask them to check the location. I would say about 90% of them are in person and about 10% of them are virtual. And if it's virtual, the student just finds a place to go and log into the Zoom link that they're sent through Naviance once again. Um, Naviance also, we use it to compare data um, to determine if schools are reach realistic safety schools. Um, we ask students, parent, guardian, teachers, to use all of the forms in Naviance, the parent response form, the counselor recommendation form, and the um, teacher forms, teacher surveys. We also ask for a resume, but if a student doesn't use Naviance, that's okay, but Naviance does have a great resume feature. We ask students to request teacher letters of recommendation in Naviance, as well as requesting transcripts. And I'm just gonna say that again, because I know Ms. Ress said it, students must request through Naviance. We are not mind readers. So without that, we don't send them. Okay. Um, and the biggest, I think, best, most important feature is to track application deadlines and status. So through Naviance, students can see exactly when um, college deadlines are. They can see when the counselor slash teachers send the recs. Okay.
I have a high school senior myself um, who's interested in musical theater, so I'm in the process with you. I feel, feel your, you know, just, just all the things you're going through as well. Um, so my topic is apropos, I guess, of making it less stressful. How do you make it less stressful? And so when I thought about it, I said, hmm, how do you make anything less stressful? And I don't know if people have ideas, but when I think about it, I was nervous tonight to speak in front of you guys. Uh, it's been a while since I've been in such a, you know, kind of like a bigger room and a bit of bigger audience. It's different talking to kids sometimes. Um, I don't know, anybody else get nervous in front of large groups, speaking in front of large groups? Yeah, let's see a show of hands. And the rest of you are professional actors, or what? <laughs> Probably, right? So to make it less stressful, you make it manageable, you stay positive. So for tonight, you know, when I'm nervous about speaking, I thought, how do I make it more manageable? I plan on what I'm going to say, I think about it. I stay positive, how do I do that? This is a great opportunity to connect and share helpful information. So those are, you know, to connect that. How do you make the college process less stressful? So I came up with a kind of a, to make it epoch, but it's not epic. So if you write on your little sheet, E-P-O-C-K, and a little positive. These are my little, I didn't put it on the slide because I knew I didn't want to mess up the slide. You know? <laughs> um, but, so E, Evaluate the factors, right? What are the factors? Everybody went through those in terms of cost, programs, I'm just gonna put my little sheet here, location, right? Um, so that's the E, plan and prepare. We talked about deadlines, we talked about requirements, we talked about, you know, not leaving yourself in a panic, having, you know, that three week Turnaround time for, for transcripts. So plan and pre prepare. Um, organize is the O. And uh, my daughter, she does a spreadsheet, college spreadsheet. She has all the requirements and deadlines and whatever else. She has pre-screens and things like that because she's into musical theater. So we have, we have organized spreadsheet. Communicate, we communicate with each other at home with our students. Our counselors, we're here to help with any questions. And the K is keep it positive because we want to remind ourselves it's an exciting time of opportunity, the, you know, just to keep that focus. We just, I was talking to somebody <laughs> earlier, right before the program started, and we were talking about the spirited conversation about the essay. So, you know, keeping that positive. What can you know, telling our students, what can you do right now? Don't get stressed, take it one step at a time, you know? So now I'll go through some of the do's and the don'ts. But I think you guys kind of know them in a way <laughs> already. Um, so communicate with your counselor. Again, we're here to help. Have a balanced co college list. Um, somebody already kind of went through that in terms of balancing it, in terms of like not having too many competitive schools and, or too many safety schools or, you know, that mid-range, just to have a variety, okay, balanced list. Um, deadlines, obviously keeping those organized, I said the spreadsheet is an excellent way to do that. Um, having the applications ready, even though you're applying for early admission or early decision, uh, early you know, action or early decision, because you don't want to leave yourself in that panic and then it, it gets, you know, that positive energy is, you know, challenged, right? And then um, the dues also attend the visits and be prepared to, you know, to bring some questions, to ask questions, okay? Some of the don'ts there, don't be annoying and keep on calling the college, right? And for a decision every, every week. Don't wait until the last minute. Um, don't wait to apply for financial aid and don't do your, your student's essay. Um, I did go to um, UNC, we visited UNC, USC over the summer, and the admissions person said, the main thing we wanna know from your essay, what is meaningful, what is unique, what is important to you? And guess who the expert is for that? The student, right? Not, not us, so those are the jokes. But I think you guys know all that. 
And these, so where it's a team effort, we all have different responsibilities, right? And we do this together. We're here for support. So you take your students to colleges, visits, um, you complete the forms on Navion to give us a lot of information and feedback. You also are responsible for the, the FAFSA and the CSS profile. Um, talk conversations at home about financing in schools. Our responsibilities, which was, you know, meeting students. We're starting this week and next week and doing senior seminars. So we meet with seniors and groups and individually. We, we you know, someone else talked about, we, we not only do the college process, but we do all, you know, encompass all the post-secondary planning process to support them. We write the letters of recommendation. I know, you know, I'm new this year, but I will, I will get every ounce of feedback from the student and from you guys to represent the students in the, in the best way possible. Um, the school report, the, the other information that's included in the application, so it tells about our school or any other information that the common application asks for. And then we also touch on, you know, some of the, the financial, um, you know, conversations about the financial obligations. And then the teachers are responsible for their recommendation. So, and that's it. I will turn it back over to Mr. Kautz. It's 8.01, we're one minute late. So we have 29 minutes for questions, but we don't have to stay for all 29. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start with the first question. Raise your hand if, I, said, I don't even know if the question. Okay, this is kind of a statement. Raise your hand if you've been through this process before. Okay, everyone look around. Oh wait, keep your hands up if you've been through before. Okay, now ready, put your hands down. Let's do it the other way. Raise your hand if you've never been through this process before. Wow, okay. So check it out, everyone. Everyone's stressed. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna try to answer as many questions as possible, um, but I did get three questions while we were sitting here, so I'm gonna do those first. All right, the first one. Can colleges see how many other colleges students have applied to? The answer is no. Okay. Um, second question. If a student has a new school counselor, how does college rec letter writing work since new counselor doesn't know students well? Okay. So I'm just going to address it right now. All right. So we have two new counselors this year, like I said earlier. All right. They're both awesome. They have experience. Um, they work very well with students. They will get on it right away, make meetings with students, um, get to know them a little bit. They also have extensive notes from the counselor that the student is coming from, okay? So we will work with the two new counselors, give our feedback. Um, we also ask the student to fill out the counselor recommendation form, which we mentioned several times, and we're asking parents to please fill out your form that gives the counselor more information and more help when writing your letter, okay? I wanted to address that right away because I know two-sevenths of you are thinking that right now. Um, and the next question, is it a good idea to apply early before deadlines or does it not matter? Well, so there's two answers to that question. One, it doesn't really matter. A deadline is a deadline for applications, okay? We suggest students beat the deadlines, don't meet the deadlines. So we highly recommend if you have a November 1st, set a goal in your brain of October 25th or whatever it is that works for the student and the family, pick that and try to stick to that. That's the first part of my answer. The second part of my answer has to do with financial aid. Don't wait until the deadline, okay? Very, very, very important piece if you're really if financially it's a huge part of everything for you, for the package, for the puzzle, um, it, the application opens after October 1st this year, get on it, okay? You do not have to wait and you should not wait until the college application deadline. Okay, those were the three questions submitted to me before, um, so I wanted to answer those first. Go ahead. Or 
All right, so it's kind of like a flip-flop, back-and-forth question. If a student wants to apply early action, early decision, and they change their mind and change it to a regular decision, what should you do? And then the other part of it is, if a student says, no, I'm applying regular, and then decides to apply early at last minute. Well, um, we kindly ask that students give us a three-week kind of time frame to get all the documents put together. So if the student plans on applying early action or early decision, obviously the sooner the better. And if we get it done and they decide that they have a regular deadline instead of early, then that was just more work for us in the beginning, but <laughs> we'll get over it. No, um, It's okay, then all the stuff will be all done for regular deadlines. Where it becomes tricky is if a student tells us they're not applying early and it's Christmas, so excuse me, it's winter vacation and all of a sudden we get an email over break, we cannot guarantee that that transcript and letter is gonna be there by, let's say, January 1st. So we really kindly ask that students really think through the process, um, whether they're gonna apply early or regular. Um, we're all a great team, so we are flexible, okay? We know things change. We're not super sticklers, but you know, early action, early decision is a very high, powered, fast-moving time frame for us. Like, we're cranking in October because, you know, we have about 50 to 60% of our class, senior class, that applies early action or early decision. So we're on the move and we're, we're really busy. So if early action or early decision is really on their radar, we really need to know relatively early. Did I answer your question okay? Okay, all right, right behind you and pink kind of. That's a great question. Does early action have a higher acceptance rate? So, it's, um, it's a very hard answer to give you a yes or a no. It's college specific. Some early action schools, sometimes if it's safety, sometimes they might have a higher acceptance rate. Um, but for the most part, my answer would be look at the college specific websites to see what their acceptance rates are for early action, early decision, regular decision. Early decision, much of the time, has a higher acceptance rate, but think really carefully about whether or not the student should apply early decision because, you know, it's binding. So early decision, I would give you more of a definitive yes answer on a higher acceptance rate for many schools. Early action, um, it really depends. Um, we, we do say to some students, you know, hey, those, that looks like a safety school to, you know, for you, and if you want to get it out of the way and just get an admissions decision back a little earlier, then early action um, may be the way to go. But I can tell you from the past two years with COVID, early action has really shifted. Um, more and more students applied early action, which made the acceptance rate go down a little bit. Um, so some of our, what used to be safety schools, we're not gonna be recommending them as safeties this year. Um, so there really has been a shift, like schools such as UVM or UMass Amherst, um, you know, they had quite a huge, dramatic actually, increase of early action applicants, which made the pool more selective. All right, sorry, yeah, right here. Green, sorry, green shirt, I don't even know what's that. Right, yeah. So when you talk about the additional writing, are students gonna find that in the Common App or on the school website? So additional writing, I'll call it supplemental stuff, okay? So there's, the Common, the Common App has supplemental essays that come with the actual specific school, it's on the Common App, but then, and then there's the COVID supplemental writing that's in the Common App, okay? And some schools that are non-Common App might have some extra, like, questions and such, but for the most part, the extra supplemental essays are within the Common App under the specific college the student is applying to. Right behind you, yeah. Yes, my question is, does early decision uh, affect scholarships? Because there, have, there is some back and forth as to if you apply with uh, early decision that uh, they may not be as amenable to provide, you know, um, the kind of scholarship that you're looking for. Is that true? So, Question is, with early decision, um, does the, I'll, I'll call it the financial aid package slash scholarships change, or is it less likely for you to get as much? 
Um, you know, so I want to break that down in a couple ways. One, there's some early applications, priority applications that are not binding that have scholarships. I'm just going to pick BU as an example because it's down the road. But BU has the December 1st deadline only for like the presidential scholarship. Okay, so that's one one way. So you have priority, which might include college specific scholarships. You have early decision that students are applying to, they are not gonna see the full financial aid package when they get their acceptance. So that's the trick with early decision. You have to really be 110% positive that financially you can afford the school um, and 110% positive that you want to attend that school because you do not see the full package of what they're gonna offer you. So that's, that's where it's a little catchy. Um, for the kids that are possibly thinking about doing a gap year that maybe they still want to go to a four-year college but want to take that year off, is it better for them to apply and get accepted and defer than it is to not apply and then go back to it? Can you speak to that? Absolutely. So gap year, what's the process? So we have probably 2% of less or less students apply to do a cap gap year at least for the past couple of years. We'll see how it, how it shifts. But we highly recommend students go through the same application process, whether they're taking a gap year or applying to go to college right after high school. And it's truly for convenience, right? Letters of recommendation, transcripts, college app help. Um, and most schools allow the student to defer, which means you pay the deposit and the student has a year to do their gap program and then they just start up just start up at a specific school a year later. So we do highly recommend it. There are some students that apply, get in, put a deposit down, do a gap year, change their mind and don't want to go to that specific school, which is fine, you just lose your deposit. Um, and students have to do the whole application process again. Um, sometimes that may, there may be a perk there, maybe the gap year program was so rewarding that it might look great to some colleges that the student didn't get into to begin with. You know, there's different, different ways to look at it, but if anyone's student in here wants to take a gap year next year, we do highly recommend they do the entire process with their peers. So 20 years I've been here, and that's the first time I've had that question. That's awesome. Um, OK, so the, the question is, so I'm going to ask, wait, before I tell you the question, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you looking at that data on the college-specific website or on Naviance? I guess it really doesn't matter, but I'm just curious. I think it was on Council More. Council More, OK. OK, so the question is, how important is that number, uh, that percentage of students that, that retain at that specific school? So, um, you know, some, so Naviance has data where it says, uh, let's just pretend 60% are accepted, 50% graduate in four years, 20% graduate in six years. You know, there's a bunch of different information when you look at that. Um, the school, the college itself puts that information in Naviance or on these, on these websites. Um, I think it scares some people because they think, wow, um, only 50% graduate from these schools. But um, I think as long as the student does their ample research on the specific college and it has the programs they're looking for and the majors and all the opportunities there, then it sounds like a great fit to me. I wouldn't totally take those numbers into the decision-making process. But it's a great question. Do you guys have anything you want to add to that? I, I always, we, we pull that up when we look at Naviance together because sometimes the, something that factors into that number is um, if it's a school where there's a heavy transfer population, you know, kids transferring in, transferring out. But I do think it's an important point of data. Is it a more of a commuter school? Do you know what I mean? Like what's the culture? Can your students sink in there and feel like they're part of something? Is it a ghost town on the weekend? It's kind of all part of that like fit. 
It's, it's such a great question, though. If it's a low graduation number, not that you would hinge, like Ms. Rakowski says, everything on it, but it's like a data point. Why is it low? Why is it low, and is it, I mean, this is, I don't know how you define this information, but is it, um, you know, certain majors where kids just, students aren't, you know, continuing with, or is it a change of, like mind, or is it a student just not doing their really good research, whether or not they want a large school or a small school, or, you know, it's really, you know, I see the, at much larger schools, I see that the graduation rate is, is lower, you know, is it because the population is larger? I don't know, it's, it's, it's a really, I appreciate the question, though. Thank you. Yeah. So, I'm wondering about the, um, the visits, the in school, um, college rep visits. Um, I so the question is about in-school college rep visits. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview. Um, we have about 150 reps coming to the school this fall. Um, we, counselors, not so much teachers, no. We counselors think it's a great program, all right? So for the most part, it's the admissions representatives that review your student's application, okay? So they come here, they meet with students. Sometimes it might be a one-on-one. -on -one. That's awesome, right? The student gets to connect with the admissions person. Other times it might be a couple kids, and we might have, I'd say, no more than, I don't know, 10 students UMass Amherst, we have the whole school, no. But it's really, um, you know, I, I think they're very valuable. Unfortunately, these absences are not excused, okay? So each student is given six absences per quarter. On the seventh, they get what's called an FA, which is just a failure due to attendance. So our guidance is really, the students should pick and choose the schools they really, that are important to them. Don't just go hang out with your friends. Pick the school that you really like, Go sign up through Naviance, go to the rep, meet them. If you can't stay the whole time, try to make a connection. If not, it's okay. Um, we do feel it is an excellent way for students to find out more about it, about the schools. The teachers sometimes do give pushback. Our message is very clear. Do not miss a test. Don't miss a major project. Don't miss a quiz. If you're part of a group presentation, don't miss that. We're very, very, very clear with the students. Um, but it is something really beneficial to, to the students. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So say there is a test someday, but that's the day the school is really interested in. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend? Should they send an email to that person and say, I'm sorry, I missed that session, but I really am interested in the school? <laughs> So if a student has a conflict and they can't attend and they really like the school, like Ms. Hurst said earlier in her presentation, contact and interest is very important. So if the student has a second and they can write an email, we can give them the name of the rep. It's in Naviance too, but they can um, send them an email, sorry I wasn't able to attend, you know, thank you, can you send me any information? You know, just, of course, you, they could schmooze with the reps, definitely. Okay, way in the back, I think a black shirt, I think, okay. So question, either or, what if they're interviewing and meeting the rep? Here, our message is, unfortunately, with the competitive times, the more interest, the better, right? But we also don't want to pressure the students and make them crazy, do this, do that, do this, do that. So if the student is interviewing and they have a major class conflict and they can't attend, then don't attend the rep visit here. Um, you know, and that's the other option too. Students, not all schools do interviews, but if the school does interviews, and they, and they want to do that as well. They could do an interview or a rep visit or whatever it is, but um, just we, we ask students to demonstrate interest. Okay. Black mask. <laughs> I don't know. If, uh, if your student is still looking in the like 16 to 18 colleges range, <laughs> at what point do you tell them you're just making yourself miserable? <laughs> we do a lot of that.
And we try to save you money too while you're at it. We're like, look, you're costing your parents over a thousand bucks in application fees, so just cut it out. Um, no, we really, really, really try. I mean, we really see a trend towards 10 schools, nine, 10 schools is really what we're seeing. Um, over the past couple of years, the number of schools has really increased. Um, not just because some schools gave out free waivers, also the, the SAT, ACT waiver, like the, the test optional has created this like yuck. I, I don't know, like we're really trying to say, hey look, like stop applying to so many because the more you apply to, obviously the more money, but the more supplemental essays you have to write, the more stress you have. Um, so we really try to help them with a well-balanced list. Like sometimes we'll say, oh, that doesn't meet your criteria, just chop it off. You know, but a good, a good six, six to ten, we say, but I think nine or ten is more realistic, you know, three reaches, three matches, three safety schools. So a 16 to 18, maybe pull straws. I don't know, they really need to reduce that. It's, it's quite a large number of, of applications. So we think right now is the perfect time for a semi-final list. Not a final list because there are students that are still adding colleges by, you know, close to January 1st. Um, but the semi-final list is really most important at this time. And I want to re-iterate, like, the early deadlines are what's really important. So if a student has a certain number of early schools they definitely want to apply to, it's much easier to do it that way and then add or take off later. But the semi-finalist is really the key at this point. If a student has no schools on their list, it's time for them. And, and they're thinking about applying to college, it's definitely time to start adding some to their list. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'll just go back. So start here for third row, go ahead. I think there was a quick mention of college fairs at one point. So are there any either here or any ready for all Yes, so I, I was going to send that out in my October newsletter. College fairs, there's two coming up that I know of, and they're in person. On October 6th in Peabody, they have a college fair. And on the same day, October 6th, Cambridge maybe? But I'm going to put it out. I have it on my desk to send it out. So October 6th, there's two local fairs that have, you know, over 100-something schools going to the fairs. Um, we can't host because, as you can see, we only have one third of a school right now. So, um, but maybe in the future, if you have any younger students coming, they're in the evening. They're in the evening. The other thing is, there's a virtual college. There's virtual college fairs too that students can still participate in, and that, that's in the, the newsletter too. Like the, um, you'll see like the NACAC fairs and stuff like that. That will be there. So I'll have a, a little college fair thing. So I'm going to go right behind you. Okay, so the senior seminars seem very important, and I just want to make sure that my child signs up for one, or how does that work? Like, yeah, because there's not a lot of free periods, or free, so are they, are they leaving class to come? What so senior seminars, guess what? They are excused absences. So all of your students should come. We send out emails to all the seniors, um, we're starting, matter of fact, tomorrow, one of the counselors is starting their groups. The rest of us are going through all of this week and next week. By the end of next week, your student should have had their seminar plus their transcript in their hand. So if they tell you they don't have it, they're lying, okay? So, so we'll be giving them a transcript and they have their seminars. So all the counselors reach out to the students. They should have their seminar by the end of the week. Well, I should say this week, sorry, the end of next week. Okay. And then one other quick question. Um, college board, if you are, if your student is thinking of submitting scores, how, like, and we have, you know, three weeks for the transcript, how much lead time do you need on those college board scores in order for them to get in on time? So college board on their website says two to four weeks, but I'm going to tell you differently. Um, I would say as close to the deadline, it doesn't matter. If you have a November 1st, send the scores November 1st. I mean, get it done early, so take it off the list, but there's really no sweat in getting that in as long as it's sent by the deadline. Okay, I think there was a yep, question right behind you. Go ahead. I'm just curious. It seems like a ton of effort goes into all of this, and after 20 years, you've seen a lot of mistakes and a lot of success, and I'm just wondering, 
what your analysis is for, or what you would recommend to parents most about finding a fit and, and just what are the biggest mistakes parents make? Wow. <laughs> what? I can talk for five hours, actually. I mean, I'm a parent of three kids, and I make mistakes all the time. Um, but question is, what are the mistakes parents make? I'll give you a couple. And maybe the other counselors would love to give some, too. This is actually fun. <laughs> okay. No. Parents, listen, I can tell you right now, just like I think Amy might have said it, don't write your student's essay. I guarantee you the college knows. Okay? Do not fill out their application. The college knows. I'm telling you, you'd be so surprised. I have students in my office all the time like, oh, what do your parents do? Because one of the questions is, like, mother's place of employment or, or what, you know, I don't know. Well, it's right here on the application. They have no idea. <laughs> what year did my parents graduate from college? Oh, I don't know if they went to college. Well, they did because they have a master's degree. <laughs> all right? So, so d let them take control of their application. And then the other thing is, parents, take a step back. Okay? Because your students are so stressed right now, and after the next two weeks, after we get a hold of them, <laughs> forget about it. No, seriously, they, they're very, very stressed um, for a lot of reasons. Senior year, it's like a psychological moment, developmental milestone. They're moving on, they're scared to move on. Um, really, it's, it's so important for you to take a step back. Let them have their tantrums. Let them go crazy, all right? And like I said when I first opened, just be a supportive role to them, okay? Pick maybe one day a week or whatever works for your family and say, hey, can we meet on Sunday night to talk about your college applications or Monday night if you want to ruin your week? Whatever it is, <laughs> sit with them, listen, okay? Listen to what they have to say. If they're asking for your help to fill out the application, sit next to them, let them do the typing, even though they're probably gonna annoy you, okay? <laughs> and just be there as a support. What happens is we hear from so many students that my parents are, you know, they won't stop and they won't leave me alone and I, you know, I can't take it and they lose themselves, okay? So just pick a time that works for your family and, and go from it that way. Now, you don't have to take my advice. I'm, we just, on our end, we just hear the kids bitching and momenting all the time and crying. So, you know, take it how, whatever works for your family, all right? But that's my, that's my biggest advice. Those are the biggest parenting mistakes that we feel. And trust me, for those kids that are super stressed, we have supports, okay? The counselors, social workers, we have whatever we can do to help your students feel better about this crazy process. And one more thing about parenting mistakes. Scholarships, okay? So many students don't know what their parents' financial, like, financials are. Um, so students feel, we don't need to fill out scholarships. We're OK. My parents are going to pay for it. I'm this, that, and the other. But that's something that when the students really get done with the application process, they're done. They're spent. They don't want to spend another second filling out an application. Well, this is where you start to nag, OK? And you start to say, please fill out these scholarships, this, that, and the other. Treat it like the application process. Maybe once a week, sit down, talk to them. You know, I, in the newsletter, we send out information of when all these start coming out, which, by the way, isn't until, like, January. So don't ask me until then, okay? So the scholarships will come out January, February, March. Um, but that's the, a big parenting mistake, is not realizing that how much money is given. Last year, we gave out $460,000, okay, just to the seniors. So it's a lot of money. And people who, who apply to those scholarships, they get them. It's not just some national scholarship that goes into a crazy database. All right, so a good parenting thing is to really kind of make sure they stay in the loop. And one more parent thing, if possible, if you can, okay? Do not shoot daggers at me. Really try to take on the financial aid process yourself. Take that burden away from the student because they already have so much on their plate. If you can't do it, I'm not talking about scholarships, I'm talking about the financial aid forms. If you can't do it, 
there are supports out there to give you free assistance with your financial aid packages. Okay, and we'll send out all of those resources. It's so like Matt said twice, come to financial aid night. Very important. Okay. Thank you for that parenting question. I love that question. It was great. Go ahead. So, I'm sorry to end this night on such a bummer question about rejections. <laughs> It's 8.30, I'll give you one more minute. Okay, so, rejections, right? We all have rejections, students all have rejections. Question is, how do we prepare students with rejections? So, one, we sit down with all the students and look at their college lists to make sure it's well balanced, okay? Do you like your safeties? Do you like your matches? Do you like your reaches? Okay, yes, yes, yes. Just understand that these are reaches because you're underneath the, you know, whatever, whatever college you're looking for. So really we want to balance the list that they like every single school so the rejections don't come as hard, okay? So the well-balanced list is the key. Where it becomes really hard is if a student applies to 10 reaches and one safety and they hate their safety. That's a big problem. Okay, so that's where parents can come in, that's where the counselors come in. We look at the list and we make sure. So sometimes your kids might come home, students might come home and say, God, my counselor is so mean. She told me I'm not going to get into any of my colleges. Okay? Just know it's not to hurt them. It's really to help, right? To just say, look, we need to find a much more balanced list. Okay? So we work with the students. We work with the students. We are, um, we have conversations with them. Students, and, and one more thing about that is financial safeties. When students are looking at, at schools, they should have financial safety because we have more and more students every year saying, I got into my top choice school and I can't go because we can't afford it. Okay, so definitely have that conversation. And did you want to say something? I was just saying, Mrs. Oh, Ms. Hirsch, well, sorry. Back to the other question that relates to this. Don't focus on one or two schools as the end all be all. There needs to be a broad list, there needs to be a range of schools, and don't allow Auntie Sue or Grandma to give the child the feeling that they're going to, their worth is going to be judged based on their number of acceptances they get or rejections or to grant the school Grandpa went to. So it needs to really be student centered with the goal of finding the best fit for the student um, and keep it there and try to keep all of our other uh, ways that we parents and family members like to intervene and, and sort of uh, impose our feelings or our prior experiences on our students. Um, and, and keep it about the student. Thank you. Okay, so on that note, very quick wrap up. Coffee hours tomorrow morning by counselors, okay? The links, I will tonight post the, um, this presentation so you have the active links. School counseling website under announcements, okay? So the links for the coffee hour will be there as well as this presentation for tonight. ACMI will send us this recording if you want to watch this awesome night again. We will be posting this recording on the school counseling website. Um, and feel free to reach out to your student's counselor anytime, okay, at all. We're, we're more than happy with you. And we're hoping that you signed in. So you could have used the QR code on your, in your packet or up here or whatever. But thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs>